Ladies and gentlemen, my job is just to introduce our keynote speaker, James Hathaway. Do I really need to introduce James Hathaway to this audience? At least for the lawyers in this room, if you are not familiar with the work of James Hathaway, just shame on you. <laughs> but amongst you, there are also, fortunately, not lawyers, so I will take this pretext to say a few words about James Hathaway. James Hathaway is now Emeritus Professor of the Michigan University Law School. He was also with position outside USA in Australia, in the University of Melbourne, as Dean of the Faculty of Law. And also, and this was as the beginning of his career in, in Canada at the York University. Uh, James Hathaway did publish really a lot in international law and particularly in international refugee law uh, with, in my view, two essential books. The Law of Refugee Status, which was the first one, and after that the second one, The Rights of Refugees Under International Law. And fifth, more or less, nearly 15 years ago, when my university here in Belgium, the Université Catholique de Louvain, Louvain-la-Neuve, awarded a doctora honoris causa to James Hathaway, here is what I said when I had to present James Hathaway to the Faculty of Law. I said, James Hathaway rigorously extracts the refugee issue from the simple humanitarian compassion, however honorable, and grants it in the law. And I think this sounds with your work in this Vulner research. James Hathaway, of course, has strong conviction but in the same time, he is very rigorous in his academic work. And I think he warned us against this temptation to go too far with what I will call wishful legal thinkings and unclear interpretation that will weaken the international system of human rights protection. Coming back to his second book, the, the Rights of Refugee in International Law, um, for the second edition, uh, at the end of the acknowledgement at the beginning of the book, uh, referring to the memory of the late Luis Peral Fernandez, uh, James Hathaway, wrote this, a response to the arrival of refugees has to be characterized by both clear thinking and generosity of spirit. I think James Hathaway both are needed to get out of what the title of your keynote speech is the quagmire of vulnerability in refugee and asylum law. James Hathaway, floor is yours. Well, thank you, Jean-Yves, for a, a typically generous introduction. Um, We've been on a long journey together for many years, and to have nice words spoken by somebody I so admire is a real gift, so thank you. And, and, and thank you to Vulner for inviting me to be with you. And I want to especially thank all of you for still being here. 
I have to say, I've never been asked to give a keynote at 6.30 at night before. Uh, usually it's first thing in the morning when you're all fresh. Uh, you do know there's a cocktail at the end, right? So bear with me. Uh, there is a reward for your patience if you can make it through. Uh, and, and I hope that will be enough that you will stick with me. What I'm going to speak about uh, this evening, if you can still remember back to Luke's really beautiful introduction this morning, falls within his third basket, the policy legal responses that incorporate vulnerability. And in fact, I'm only speaking to a portion of that basket, the policy and legal responses that implicate refugees and other protection seekers. This is where uh, I have some worries that I want to share with you as honestly as I can, uh, and in the hope that as we move forward with our discussions of vulnerability, we perhaps see where it is a better fit and where it is a less good fit uh, with the needs of the human beings who actually matter to us. So let's start with the basic question, right? Who could possibly object to protecting vulnerable people? I, like, you'd have to be a really nasty person to say that vulnerable people shouldn't be protected, right? It just automatically resonates with us as something that, again, going back to the framework, whether it's legally, as a heuristic, or ethically, seems obviously correct. And yet at the same time, as the study points out, hopefully, and it says this not once, not twice, but I think about half a dozen times, uh, vulnerability is a notoriously fuzzy concept. And this makes lawyers very nervous. Right? It should make all of you very nervous because fuzziness is a place where discretion will happen and discretion will happen in the hands of the people who have power. So just pause for a moment and take that in because that is really where my worries are coming from. As I was thinking about the Vilnau study, uh, I was uh, driving my car uh, and I saw a car ahead of me that had one of these little signs in the back window. Now, perhaps you don't have these in Europe. This may be a ridiculous, oh, you do? All right. So it works, right? I saw this sign, baby on board. And I thought, oh, you know, I've never really thought about it before. But with the idea of vulnerability in my brain, I thought, you know, what is this message actually conveying? as a rather cynical non-parent, I've always thought it meant the person driving this car is a parent and is probably horribly distracted. They're a bad driver, stay away from them. No, I mean, I know that's not what it means. Obviously, the signal is there is somebody on board, namely a baby, who is vulnerable. You've got to be extra careful, and whatever you do, don't crash into this car because somebody who is especially fragile, a baby, is inside, right? What else is it saying? But when I thought about the Vulnau study in relation to this, I thought, well, wait a second. What really is being said here? Is it saying that if there wasn't a baby inside, I could go ahead and crash into the car? that I should, in other words, not be a careful driver as a general matter, irrespective of who is in the car in front of me? And if that's not what's being said, is there really any logic to giving special attention to a car in which one of the passengers is a baby, when in truth I should be giving my full care and attention to driving well all the time and not crashing into any car with any passengers, uh, even an old guy like me at the wheel, right? What is this really sending as a signal? The Vulnau study makes clear that, again, in this third basket, vulnerability is a regional add-on to the norms of the refugee and asylum regime. At times, simply incorporated by judicial fiat, uh, 
and particularly by the European Court of Human Rights, but also codified in European Union law. The, second, the simple question that we should ask and what I'm going to be focusing on is does the trend to give special attention to vulnerability advance the protection goals of the refugee and asylum regime? Or is it a distraction? Or still worse, might it actually subtract from the net good that the refugee and asylum regime is meant to deliver? In seeking to answer the question, I think what I took away from the Vulner study, and its breadth is truly extraordinary, what I took away is that context is key. There is no one answer to that question. Despite the risk of oversimplification, and my students will tell you, a couple of people in the room have suffered through a few lectures with me over the years, they know I have a tendency to oversimplify, and I confess that's what I'm doing here. But, but at 6.30 at night, you're entitled to simple. Uh, and you can take me up on it if you think I'm wrong. But in terms of thinking about context, it seemed to me that it was useful to think in this third legal basket about using vulnerability, one, as a way to allocate scarce resources. Secondly, as a reason for procedural accommodations. Third, as relevant to identifying protected status. And fourth, as relevant to allocating rights. Now, I'm going to give you some examples in each of these four quadrants and explain why I think vulnerability might need to be thought about differently in relation to each of these four. And again, sticking with my oversimplification fetish, I think as a tool for allocating scarce resources, I have few problems. I get a little more nervous when it is the basis for procedural accommodations. I get more nervous still, and that one should actually be orange, uh, when it is used to identify protected status. And I get outright worried when it's used as a means of allocating rights. So let's start at the beginning, the relatively safe green box. And here I take as an example a couple of things. One is allocating a scarce resource of resettlement. You all know there are 17 million refugees in the world in protracted refugee situations. Less than 1% of them get resettled each year. Resettlement is a scarce resource, not in, an act, you know, in, a, in, a, in a true sense, but in a political sense. States have decided they will not resettle any meaningful number of refugees, and hence allocating those spots is a very, very important question. The second one is allocating aid and development assistance. And I want to speak briefly to each of these. So if we take the first one, the idea of resettlement, uh, again, many of you will know I rarely congratulate UNHCR on anything, uh, but I will say that in regard to the use of vulnerability in resettlement, I think they've actually done a pretty good job of framing this. It's a nice balance because as you'll see from the words highlighted in red, vulnerability is a consideration, not the consideration. And it takes second place to needs and rights, and especially to capacities. That, I think, is really smart. It's suggesting that vulnerability has relevance, but is not remotely dispositive, much less the actual totality of what we ought to be thinking about. Moreover, in a, he says hopefully, 2013 study that actually looked at how resettlement was played out, you could see that the idea of vulnerability really wasn't vulnerability in the sense that we've been talking about it thus far today. It was more vulnerability in the sense of exposure to risk, which is exactly the job of the refugee regime. So in a sense, I think what UNHCR has done is to harness the rhetorical power of vulnerability. It's an emotive word. It does get people to respond perhaps better than many other phrases, 
but it's done it in a way that doesn't change the focus on protection needs as the core of what we ought to be focused on. If the rhetorical flourish adds a little impetus and gets us more resettlement spots, so much the better. In terms of aid and development, uh, you can see, for example, in the 2015 General Assembly resolution dealing with the allocation of uh, development aid resources under the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the General Assembly relied on vulnerability as a criterion for allocating aid to refugees. Now, I do want you to look at it carefully. And I begin to get just a little bit more nervous here. Note that unlike the UNHCR on resettlement, where this is merely a part of the puzzle, the General Assembly assumes that all refugees are vulnerable and for that reason have special needs which should be a priority for assistance. I actually think that's wrong. If all refugees are vulnerable and entitled by that fact to a priority claim on development assistance, what does that say about the needs of the non-displaced human rights victims who are left stranded in bombed out homes by caretaking, child rearing, or other resource constraints? The lives of those people are often dramatically more difficult than those who have been able to move to at least a place of internal displacement, much less to those who are on the move outside the country of origin. And if that's so, isn't giving priority to all refugees effectively privileging some human rights victims over others on the basis of something that, unlike the UNHCR resettlement use of the term, is privileging on the basis of something other than relative need. So in truth, even though I frame this as a green box, it's actually a flashing green box. Even here, I'm not entirely sure that there is any real utility. Maybe it doesn't do any harm on the resettlement side, but it begins to raise the flag of exclusion, at least on the human rights internally displaced or non-displaced victims versus refugees in ways that I find quite unattractive. Let me turn to the second quadrant. Using vulnerability to flag where procedural accommodations are needed, providing a solution to the specific predicament of vulnerable people caught up in the asylum process. And here are a few examples of that. One is the idea of prioritizing asylum applications from vulnerable persons. Another is allowing a support person to be present at a hearing, as Norway does, for a vulnerable person. And a third is having specially trained decision makers for vulnerable people, as Belgium does. In all of these ways, vulnerability is used as a linchpin to a somewhat more full-blooded and fairly framed process than would be generally available. Now, at one level, you know, I've characterized these applications as yellow, meaning not necessarily risky, because while they are overall good things, I still think they can be a little bit messy. For example, while one might imagine that moving people who are more susceptible to risk, vulnerable people, to the front of the queue to have their asylum claims heard may make sense, is it because they can perhaps l tolerate delay less well than non-vulnerable people, I guess the idea goes? The European Union muddies the water in this regard by insisting on a categorical filter for who qualifies as vulnerable. Only vulnerable people defined in accordance with Article 21 are really vulnerable people. And they're the only ones who are going to get these things. So you can see what's going on here. I mean, part of me wants to do the law professor thing and put, say, you know, why mention unaccompanied minors when minors are already in? Why set out mental disorders when serious illness is already there? The bottom line, it's badly drafted in my view. 
the truth is the categorical approach, and that's what this is, while open-ended, nonetheless seems clearly designed to facilitate bureaucratic implementation rather than to, imp to really identify vulnerability. And going back to the specific issue of prioritizing the speed with which an asylum claim is heard, getting vulnerable people to the front of the queue over others, Stand back for a second when you think about the categories that were there. Is it really the case that being elderly or ill, for example, means suffering more than does anyone else who has to accept delays in the processing of their applications? I'm not sure that it does. And yet the categorical approach would force that result. The second example I gave you, the you know, lovely Norwegian example, and I've, I've taught a lot in Norway. You know, we all love Norwegians. People think it's Canadians. Canadians love the Norwegians. You're good people. You do good things. You get it right. You're going to allow a support person to come into the hearing uh, if a vulnerable person is being examined. It's an undoubtedly kind gesture, right? Uh, but May I ask the question, why shouldn't we do that for everyone? Why shouldn't every asylum applicant be able to have a support person present when they're being interviewed? It's nerve wracking for everyone. Even the most articulate, poised, professional person undergoing asylum adjudication, in my experience, is likely to be highly traumatized by the need to recount the events and to realize what's on the line in a really horribly difficult process. So why privilege vulnerable people only? Similarly, I have no problem with the idea of specially trained decision makers for particular cases. And I presume that, for example, in Belgium, one might have an individual who knows how to interview a child, interview a child, and, and, and that's great, right? But in, again, in my experience, there really is no asylum claim that I can think of where having somebody with specialized knowledge, for example, of language or cultural or with political or social experience related to the culture of origin, country of origin, wouldn't make a huge difference. Why would we want to do this only for vulnerable people rather than have specialized decision makers for all refugees? And that is why I see it as a yellow category. In all of these examples that I've given you, there's nothing necessarily wrong with doing these nice things for vulnerable people, but there's nothing clearly obvious about privileging a so-called vulnerable person, particularly if defined in an EU categorical style way, with these advantages over any and all others. And this is where we begin to see the beginnings of the slippery slope, where what undoubtedly we all want to think of as a concept that does good for people that we care about begins to be seen as something that has potentially unfair, if not flat out disfranchising potential. So that brings me to, and I'm dying to know why when it transmuted from San Francisco to Belgium, orange became yellow. Are you guys anti-orange or something here? I mean, I, I know we're not in the Netherlands, but I mean, anyway. Uh, the third quadrant, which should be orange, uh, and I'll give you a couple of examples here of identifying protected status. The two obvious ones are the evaluation of the gravity of risk faced, which is done in the European Court of Human Rights, and the use of vulnerability as an amorphous criterion for the granting of asylum in the European Union's qualification directive. Importantly, and if anybody here, you know, now I am speaking to the non-lawyers, I hope, uh, is, is unfamiliar with this, you need to understand what the norm is in refugee law, in assessing refugee status. All one has to show is that there is a real chance 
that if returned, the applicant would face a real chance of being persecuted because of who she is or what she believes. That assessment of being persecuted, and this is really important to the everything else I'm going to say, in Europe in particular, absolutely must, by European law, be rooted in core norms of international human rights law. This is not an amorphous notion. This is a tightly constrained, albeit flexible, criterion that Europe has codified, even as many other countries, including my own, have incorporated by practice. But here, more than anywhere else, it is the case that linking your circumstances to the potential forward-looking, not the past, forward-looking potential, real chance, not probability, of a human rights risk is all that is required. In contrast to that norm, what things in the orange category seem to me to be doing is superimposing effectively an additional criterion on top of that, making the test harder for people to get protected status by saying not only must you meet the classic refugee definition, but vulnerability will somehow be treated as an added factor. And let me just show you what I mean by that. This is an idea that was pioneered in the Article III case law of the European Court of Human Rights. So for example, in the case of an Afghan asylum seeker disabled by a rocket launch, the Strasbourg court found that because, look at the red words carefully, because he was not particularly vulnerable due to a disability, he did not qualify for protected status. If you had been particularly vulnerable, you might have gotten through the door. Well, why? Why would we be asking that stupid question? Why is it not enough to ask what kind of risk would be faced, vulnerable or not vulnerable? And why would adding vulnerability into the equation change the human rights framework that ought to be governing the adjudication of the case in the first chance? Why do we care whether he was particularly vulnerable rather than just vulnerable, if you want to push the language a little farther? Why should he have to meet an enhanced risk standard rather than just show the risk full stop? And what we see here is the notion of vulnerability, however well-intentioned its importation, is now serving to raise the bar for protected status from simply a real chance of harm to some kind of greater enhanced super added risk. This super added slippery slope, though, becomes even worse when you shift from the Council of Europe to the European Union. In the qualification directive, the EU states, and you can see it here, that vulnerability is a mandatory consideration for the adjudication of protected status. Well, is that necessarily a bad thing for refugees? Of course not. But the vague admonition, whatever this hell this means, to take vulnerability into account. What do I do? Look at it and whistle? Uh, what do I do with this thing? What it doesn't do is to cabin judicial or administrative discretion in any way. Given both the history and the approach taken by the companion provision of EU law on reception conditions that I'll speak to in a moment, there is, I think, every reason to worry that those implementing EU law will, over time, follow the European Court of Human Rights down the path of using vulnerability as effectively a filter finding, if I may put it this way, some protected people to be more deserving than others of protected status. The critical point then, if I may be clear, is that I don't see any advantage in taking this risk. Putting vulnerability into this equation is giving us nothing. Because it has long been accepted that the risk assessment of asylum adjudication must take account of particular vulnerabilities. But vulnerabilities in the non-bureaucratic, 
non-categorical sense of paying close attention to the characteristics of the person in front of you. This is accepted doctrine throughout the world at this point because that is our starting point. That is what refugee law already requires. Surely nothing more is needed. This is because refugee law, again, is explicitly anchored in an individuated examination of the reality of risk and to doing so not under some fungible, I know it when I see it, take account of standard, but under a human rights framework. So just to give you a couple of examples, the vulnerability that may follow from gender is, as the British House of Lords determined roughly two decades ago, inherently a part of how one has to approach the assessment of risk. It is part of each individual's makeup. It is part of how one knows whether the risk rises to the level of being persecuted. We don't need to throw a vulnerability veneer onto the Refugee Convention to get there. And similarly, when we're looking at the question of children, age has always been understood to be a critical factor in figuring out whether a person's experience crosses the threshold from unhappiness to a risk of being persecuted. That's already built in. Even the United States, which is probably the least law-abiding of any developed state on asylum law, even in the horrible United States, this has been understood. So why would we risk adding a highly subjective veneer onto the top of something that already does the job that we want vulnerability to do, namely to require you to assess status by reference to the real risk faced by the real person given everything about his or her makeup who stands in front of you. So my point then is because human rights norms already are part of refugee and asylum law, not part of, the core of, the core test of refugee and asylum law, unlike the fuzzy notion of vulnerability. Why not use standards like these that are continuously and authoritatively interpreted, not just in the brain of one decision maker? Why descend into the categorical oversimplification that we see in the EU standards? Why give way to unfettered judicial or administrative subjectivity, is it not the case, as Lord Justice Laws made clear some years ago in the United Kingdom, that what we want is decision makers having to justify what they do on the basis of some objective principle. That's what we call accountability. It's not about allowing the judge to make it up because he or she does or doesn't see it as vulnerable or does or doesn't want to categorize it as part of the vulnerable list. We want the person to actually do the hard job of taking account of the person in front of us. Now my worries get even more serious in the fourth and you will be relieved to hear final quadrant, namely the allocation of refugee rights. This I can't resist putting in here Refugee rights are what the European Union euphemistic, euphemistically calls reception conditions. Why the hell the EU cannot just utter the words refugee rights has always been a mystery to me. Reception conditions. No, this is about rights. These are not discretionary things. These are not about conditions. These are about the entitlements that are the essence of refugee status. Refugee status is a rights-granting status. That's what it is, and it needs to be treated that way. The problem is, again, the vulnerability overlay is, I think, being used in at least two ways that I identified to truncate the rights of all refugees by reserving some rights regarding specificity for those deemed to be vulnerable. The most general is whether the reception conditions are adequate, and the more specific is whether and what detention is appropriate. Turning to the first line of cases, the adequacy of reception conditions, you'll again probably all be aware of the MSS case in which 
an Afghan refugee forced to live on the streets of Athens was found to be entitled to special protection. Why? Because he was vulnerable. Well, and what if you're not? Take a look at another case where there were no perceived special asylum seeker vulnerabilities. The court refused to intervene to require any improvement in reception conditions. So vulnerable will intervene, not vulnerable or not particularly vulnerable, no. So this raises red light concerns for me. The first and most obvious is the fact that vulnerability and perhaps even rel relative vulnerability, whichever phrase the court chooses to use on a given day, are highly subjective legal notions very much understood through the proverbial eye of the beholder. But secondly, and much more important, this approach plays into a false narrative that there is not a duty to enable all refugees to meet their needs while awaiting an asylum determination. That, if you take away nothing else from me today, that narrative is just entirely false. I know EU law tries to codify it, but to the extent it does, EU law is illegal. The Geneva Convention, to which EU law is subordinate, makes clear that refugee status is declaratory. You have rights by virtue of who you are, not by virtue of some decision maker having said that you have them. And they accrue from the moment you arrive in the state's jurisdiction, not once you've been blessed or handed a pretty little document with a fancy title on it. So the kinds of issues that were just looked at in the two cases, having the means to survive while you're awaiting asylum adjudication, which the court found had to be provided to vulnerable refugees, but maybe not to non-vulnerable refugees, in fact, under the international law that binds all European Union states, I went too fast that time, can I go back? Uh, is already the entitlement of all of the people in the system, be they vulnerable, kind of vulnerable, really vulnerable, sort of vulnerable, or not vulnerable at all. And you begin now really to see what's happening. This is a divide and conquer strategy. This is enabling administrative withdrawal from the obligations that bind states by use of a categorical imperative that is not part of refugee law and which is fungible enough to do whatever job those in a position of power decide they want it to do. What does it mean to be vulnerable? What does it mean to be more vulnerable than others? Do you really want to put refugee rights into the basket of that kind of analysis? Refugee rights that under the treaty that binds Europe are the entitlement of all. We don't need or want that overlay. We also see this in the more specific context of looking at detention. Not only does the EU adopt the European Court of Human Rights selectivity approach to standard of living issues, as you can see here, why are we only worried about the standard of living for vulnerable people it does the same thing in the EU in relation to the issue of detention. We should be worried about the mental health of those in detention who are vulnerable. Well, why the hell shouldn't you be worried about the mental health of everyone who is in detention? That's your job. You don't get to choose selectively as among those you prefer or give a particular label to. Under international human rights law, any time anyone is deprived of their liberty, and especially, says the UN Human Rights Committee, in the context of administrative rather than criminal proceedings, 
There is an extremely high duty of care that incorporates everything that the European Court of Human Rights was looking at in the first case involving the asylum seeker in Greece. You may not simply decide that some refugees get it and others don't. There is a general duty of care and carefully to monitor the detention of all refugees, not some of them. So again, what we are seeing in my view is European law deploying vulnerability as a wedge to justify selectivity in the allocation of rights that are under global law the rights of every protection seeker. The real damage done by this selectivity masquerading as kindness to the vulnerable is that it legitimates detention for some so-called non-vulnerable refugees despite the fact that in truth the detention of any refugee claimant more than very briefly and selectively is patently illegal. And this came up in the earlier discussion, and no, I am not just pointing the finger at Germany, but I am pointing the finger at Germany. Any regime that mandatorily detains people seeking protection other than for the short amount of time required to verify identity and satisfy security concerns is unlawful under the Geneva Convention. And just for those of you who might be feeling smug that I called on Germany because, oh, you don't, you don't, we only have reception centers. I don't care what you call it. You can call it a jail, you can call it a holding place, you can call it a reception center. Under international law, it makes no difference. These are all places of presumptively arbitrary and hence illegal detention after the point in time described here. So I raise these protection concerns not in aid of an argument that incorporating vulnerability is always and necessarily dangerous. I want to be clear, the idea behind the four quadrants is that the risk rises as you move from top left to bottom right. But I do think it helps us to understand how context may in fact be really quite important in thinking through whether we really want to buy into this vulnerability framework in the context of refugee and asylum protection. The fundamental concern that I'm voicing, and this may be a place on which some of us will part company, but I want to be clear about why I'm saying what I'm saying. It follows from the fact that refugee and asylum law is not migration law. Stop amalgamating the two. It may be that vulnerability is a useful concept to give coherence to non-refugee debates about migration in general. That's true because migration in general isn't anchored in any particular commitment to the vindication of any ethical or other standard. It's seen at best as part of the domain reserve of states subject to limited exceptions. Maybe we can use the leverage that vulnerability gets us to do some good for those who move and are not seeking protection. But this is absolutely not the case in refugee and asylum law. We do not have a normative void that vulnerability might help us fill. To the contrary, we've already got, as I've shown you, a standard that is not only deeply principled, regularly interpreted authoritatively, but formally embedded in law and has been recognized as the conceptual footing for refugee and asylum law, namely human rights law. That human rights law foundation can already provide everything that vulnerability should offer. Adding a veneer of vulnerability to refugee and asylum law not only adds no value in my view, but it poses the risks that I've elaborated of categorical oversimplification and setting up of hierarchies as suffering rooted in unbridled subjectivity. To see refugee and asylum law as part and parcel of migration is really fundamentally to misunderstand what it is.
for refugees and protection seekers, migration is simply a practical means to access a protection end. It is not the end. It is concept refugee law is both conceptually more powerful and more coherent and less prone to machinations and artificial delineations than would be the case for a regime predicated on vulnerability. So while understanding vulnerability as a smart and realistic construct, constraint, if you will, on the Wild West idea of migratory regimes, I think is an idea worth considering, and I'm happy that we are considering that. There is no need whatever to paste a vulnerability overlay onto an already highly principled, codified, human rights-based asylum regime. In short, my plea is that we disaggregate refugee law from migration law as we pursue our discussions of the potential value of vulnerability. In making this point, I'm not remotely original. Jean-Yves Carlier has already made that point several years ago right, in a much more succinct and more eloquent way than I've been able to do. When we rely excessively on vulnerability, we risk replacing a human rights foundation with a vague charity. The human rights approach that is already codified in EU law more than suffices to do justice to the vulnerabilities of those seeking protection without those risks that I've described. I believe for this reason we would do well to heed the advice that the Vulnau Project itself gave in May of 2022. It's essential to preserve current legal categories such as the refugee category and prevent their replacement by a policy focus on vulnerabilities, which may in the end limit the asylum regime to the most vulnerable refugees and asylum seekers. If you think externalization and the Rwanda deal and all of these things are horrible, you are correct, but do not miss out on what is happening here. The thing that has been sacrosanct is the refugee concept and refugee rights. And now we've come up with a concept that looks and sounds pretty that actually enables us lawfully to cut those back. That's where I think we are. Maybe it has application beyond the refugee asylum context, as Luc Leboeuf himself has suggested. That's not my role to talk to. I presume we'll continue that discussion tomorrow. But to conclude with the metaphor with which I began, Instead of arguing for the specificity of worrying about babies on board, I think it would be a lot better if we committed ourselves to a generic, all-embracing admonition to go slow, to go very slow, if you will, in line with human rights law. And by slow, I don't mean in the speed sense. I mean in the care sense, in the duty of care sense that the human rights law foundation of refugee and asylum law already requires that claims be procedurally and substantively addressed with the real care that takes account of the individual herself or himself, not privileging some subset deemed vulnerable, whether by a decision maker or by the European Union. I think that's the way we should go. I think we need to be careful to limit our discussions of vulnerability to the non-refugee migratory context where, again, we do have a normative void, but in the refugee context, please, whatever we do, don't give up on what we've, what we've got. I can't see my watch. It's kind of dark up here. Okay. I'm happy to do anything, but I also believe in the human right to rest and leisure. So um, does anybody have a 
And I'd prefer to do them one by one so I don't forget what somebody has asked. But does anybody have a comment or question you'd like to make as opposed to like harassing me over cocktails, which is fine? Anybody? I, it's, why am I not surprised? Is that what I get for quoting you at the end, Luke? <laughs> Hello, thank you. Thank you very much. I think it, it was a very uh, thought-provoking talk, and I think it's it, it's very important indeed to to, to remind us uh, of the importance of uh, maintaining the legal standards that are there and not forgetting uh, about them. Uh, I, I just have a, a a question, which is uh, maybe uh, also n not in defense of the concept, but uh, to to try to still keep reflecting on it. I, I mean, there are still some advantages of using it in a refugee context. Uh, if you uh, consider a bit better the context in which, uh, and you, you said it yourself, and context matter very much, yep. the context in which the law is implemented and is applied. And I'll, I'll give you two examples. Okay. Uh, maybe the, the first one uh, will be uh, how can you, as a court, take certain decisions that can be taken very badly by a certain part of the people, decision that you know will be difficult to accept for states. And here I'm thinking about the European Court of Human Rights and the MSS ruling in particular, where vulnerability was used by the court not so much as a key element of the argumentation, simply as a way to justify the argumentation. Because th what the court did in, in MSS is simply to remind that because asylum seekers uh, are submitted to a special treatment by the state, much like people who are detained, and as the Human Rights uh, Committee also said with respect to people who are detained, because people, asylum seekers, are submitted to that special treatment of the state, they cannot work, they have restriction on their freedom of movement, etc., etc. The state has additional responsibilities towards them. And isn't there maybe some interest of explaining that by using vulnerability, uh, which is among this notion that can generate consensus today around migration? You said it yourself in the beginning as well. Huh? We will be nasty enough to say, I don't want to protect those who are vulnerable. So isn't there some interest for courts to use vulnerability not so much as a key element in the reasoning, but as a way to justify the reasoning, given the context in which that reasoning is being given? And my second question that relates to this contextual element is also related very much, and that's something I've learned from working for with anthropologists for almost six years now, is, isn't there something to consider, uh, and shouldn't we better consider, the way the law is always implemented in individual cases? And what I mean by that is that when you implement the law, there is always some leeway. Uh, it's not true that the judge implements the law moving from the legal text to the facts with one simple solution. It's not a mathematical reasoning. Mm -hmm. There is always a kind of leeway. And can't you use vulnerability as a way to maybe organize that leeway where you can see that it is problematic? Mm -hmm. And here I'm thinking about maybe the proposal I, I tried to make earlier on, uh, which is this need we have in Europe of having a common asylum policy, because practices differ very much across countries. We already have a common asylum law. We don't have a common asylum policy. And can vulnerability be a tool that will guide the practices across the EU in the same direction. And that's where I'm, I'm, I'm seeing maybe that there is still some interest of keeping the context, uh, the concept, even in relation to refugee law, when one considers the context in which refugee law is being implemented, right. especially in Europe nowadays. Right. So this, um, this is well, my question. <laughs> uh, a dynamite question, as I would have expected. Let me be, let me be clear first that all of the good substantive stuff that vulnerability might be able to deliver is already in international human rights law. The UN Human Rights Committee did this a quarter century ago. So I'm not saying getting rid of any of the specificity or any of the particularization. That is mandatory. It's not discretionary. But on your two specific points, is it a nice tool that enables judges to soft pedal difficult decisions? Uh, maybe, but there are two problems with that, I think, right? The first problem is that once a judgment is released, it takes on a life of its own. And you issuing that decision might well know that when you said an MSS, vulnerable or particularly vulnerable, 
you didn't mean it this way. You have no way of controlling how national judges, much less national decision makers, much less national bureaucrats, are going to manipulate what you've just unleashed on the world, right? You can't. It's risky. And secondly, what is wrong with the rhetorical value embedded in the European Charter, for God's sake, of respect for human rights? I mean, this is not, it's, it's not like I'm out there arguing, you know, for, I don't know, the right to carry guns or something disgusting. I'm advocating the right to respect human rights, which is at the core of the European Union process, not, not per me, per the damn charter. So I don't think it's required. I think you have to be brave, as Lord Justice Law says, and anchor things in principles that actually undergird the system and not whitewash it. On your second one, oh my gosh, I just, does it actually give maybe a bit of helpful leeway? Is there an absolute that comes out of anything? Absolutely not. But here you and I may disagree. I think it tends to be the case that the human rights framework, while obviously there is room at the margins for what is or isn't a human rights breach, I think it is better that 80 or 90% of the content is not up for debate. That it is not only codified, but regularly interpreted by an authoritative body appointed by states that oversees the treaty and not one judge getting to make it up on his or her own which is what vulnerability does, or one bureaucracy making it up on its own, which I would find equally objectionable. So yes, is there going to be some flexibility? Totally. But my preference would be that the flexibility exists at the margins and that the core not be negotiable. And my worry is that vulnerability makes the core negotiable again. I, I know it's like, I, I'm in the hands of the moderators. migrants that does not exist. I don't know if it ever existed, but it hasn't existed for the last 15 years. Today's uh, asylum seekers are tomorrow's mig migrants without status, and today's migrants without status might be the asylum seekers and the refugees of tomorrow. Mm. So while all that you say is totally true, we cannot posit anymore this distinction and say vulnerability is actually uh, undermining the rights of, of asylum seekers and refugees. Um, but we need to see that it's, it's a moving target, and in that sense, it mm. is a very important tool, while keeping in mind, of course, that, th that the situation is imperfect. And I would say also, I'll dare say something from a legal perspective, international law, as we know, has no one to, to, to um, how can I say, to fight for it, or it has us in this room to fight for it. It has no state, no, no authority. So maybe vulnerability can be used as a tool to instill, um, you know, to the extent that it is adopted in national law, to create obligations for states. And we know that the Global Compact for Migration in, I can't remember which uh, kind of document that was issued in, in January, um, makes a clear uh, argument about my, um, noting a whole series of migrants as vulnerable mm -hmm. and creating a right for the protection of those migrants, where, as you rightly said, there's no one. So I'm, I'm dying to know why you think incorporating vulnerability in national law is going to achieve accountability when already having adopted refugee and human rights law in the national law, you view as problematic in that regard. That, that seems to be intellectually inconsistent. You can't have it both ways. Either you believe adoption matters or it doesn't, and if it does, we've already got that in refugee law. The idea that it's a moving target, that there's no conceptual delineation, you and I will just never agree on that. I think that's just false. A person is a refugee if she meets the definition, even if she is also moving for non-persecutory reasons, she also wants a better life for her kids or to work or whatever. It takes nothing away from her refugee status. It is not a moving target. It is a standard that has existed for 70 years, and to answer your question, it has been kept alive not by UNHCR, which as you rightly point out, cannot 
dispositively say what it means, but by the judges of the world who have filled that void and who do speak to each other and who do normatively come to consensus points on, in my experience, virtually every key issue in refugee status, including modernizing it, for example, not only to include claims based, for example, on sexual orientation or gender or identity, but to make clear how climate migration can produce real refugees. This is already happening. It is happening now. And what I fear you are positing is a really risky experiment. Even though you don't think that codification of refugee law necessarily made a difference, you think codification of vulnerability is, and you're going to use a standard that has not 70 years of experience behind it, but none as a matter of law, other than the few European examples I've shown you, which have been shown to be prone to categorization and to huge subjectivity. I think that's a deal with the devil. And I tell you that if we go down that road in 10 years, we will deeply regret it. Deploy vulnerability, I think, if it is a concept that has legs, to give some normative, conceptual, philosophical foundation to non-protection migration. I'm all for it. If that's what'll sell, it's the same reason I don't disagree with the Global Compact on Migration the way I think the Global Compact on Refugees is complete crap. The Global Compact on Migration was trying to build something out of nothing. And when you're in that position, you can afford to take the chances you're describing because there's nothing to lose. In contrast, in refugee law, there is everything to lose. This is the world's most important human rights system that every year protects more people through refugee law than all of the other international human rights systems put together. And I, for one, will never stand by and allow that to be put at risk for a thought experiment. Sure, and the Women's Convention leaves out men, but I mean, what's the point? You can't say that because the convention has specificity, it's wrong. That, that just seems nonsensical to me. Of course, the best solution to the world would be that no one does anything nasty. Then no one is ever a refugee. You know, let, let's, just, let's just get right down to it. Let, let's get rid of vulnerability, and let's just say, let, let's codify peace, light, goodness, and kindness, and, and then we're all done here. But that's not the world we live in. And we've got to work within a nasty world where at least some people now get life-affirming and empowering protection in ways that no other system delivers. That's all I'm suggesting. But we can continue this over alcohol. 